Welcome to Cape Ann Art Waves. My name is Jacqueline Ganim DeFalco. I am a co producer and co host along with Christine Fisher. We are broadcasting from Gloucester, Massachusetts. On a bi weekly basis, we showcase fabulous local artists um, and their work, and we go deeply into their stories. Our show is sponsored by Prince Insurance Agency and Christine Fisher, visual artist the McDermott McCarthy team of Gibson Sotheby's International Realty and the Common Crow Natural Market. We'd like to thank our generous sponsors and also our musicians, Steve Lacey and Pat Verga for all of their work and collaboration in this show. So today we actually have two artists that we're going to interview. And so I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce you to Dana Wolf and Josh Falk. So gentlemen, please say hello to the audience today. Hello, hello. thanks for having us. <laughs> thanks for having us. Okay, great. So let me tell you a little bit about them and then we're gonna jump right into the questions. So um, I will tell you first that I learned of these two artists and their incredible collaboration um, by seeing and hearing about a mural that they did in downtown Gloucester on the fort on the side of the Ocean Crest building. And uh, I didn't realize that I was going to have such a personal connection to both of these artists because um, at least one of the people that's pictured in uh, that particular mural, Lenny McCollum, is somebody that I've known, had known for 20 years before he left us a few years ago. And so I am particularly honored and pleased today to uh, present this, although many people in the uh, local area have seen this work and maybe are even familiar with this awesome Gloucester and awesome Rockport project, uh, they may not know the story behind the artist who did the work and that's what our goal is today. So I wanted to just give you that as a backdrop. So Dana Wolf first is a visual artist living and working in Essex actually. And he's known for his vivid abstract paintings and large scale mural work. Uh, he's a New England native. He grew up in Rhode Island, and um, he really had an early start in the art world with influence from his grandmother, who was an illustrator and painter. Uh, after moving to Boston in the mid-90s um, to attend Mass Art, um, he became involved in the local graffiti scene and developed an affiliation um, with the members of, the Pro of Project SF as co-director of Project SF, which was an artist collective he directed and exhibited events worldwide and worked with clients, including Nike, Converse, Vitamin Water, and Bodega. His solo and collaborative work has appeared in publications such as Juxtapose, Boom, Inked, Acclaim, and Soul Collector. And Wolf currently works um, here in Essex with uh, Studio Fresh, um, and he continues to develop his visual language and build, um, build toward new projects. Josh, his collaborator, obviously friend and co-artist, um, is also based locally. He's right in downtown Rockport, but he was born and raised in Lemonster. He spent most of his time exploring outdoors, skateboarding, and painting graffiti, as well as woodworking with his grandfather. He attended the Art Institute of Phoenix and Fitchburg State College before eventually moving to Boston. There, he began to use photography as a means to document his various urban explorations and it soon became his main creative focus. More recently, his work evolved to include collages, painting, and site-specific sculpture work. So these are two extremely talented gentlemen that I am so pleased to introduce to you today. So welcome again. Welcome. And let's kind of... Um, jump into it. I am kind of curious, you didn't both start um, here in Gloucester and um, or Essex and in Rockport or be from Cape Ann. How did you even um, find your way to Cape Ann? That's kind of my first question. I'd say Dana would probably lead this one because you came here first. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I led yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, well, I had I lived in East Boston um, for a long time. Um, Josh and I had a business space in Southie. Um, and I had a daughter and we lived in a loft in Eastie and my daughter was about two and we were all pretty sick of living in one room together. Um, so we started looking for a house and I mean, long story short, we just kind of went up the coast until we found a town we loved. Um, and Essex was hard to not love. It was pretty perfect. I wasn't interested in moving into like a, you know, true suburb. It, it was either city or woods for me because then I already was in the city. So 
uh, and the woods was appealing. We found a great spot in Essex, landed here. And after a year or two, I don't remember exactly of commuting to Southie, um, we basically got kicked out of our studio in Southie as they turned that into condos or rent increases, whatnot. Um, and we found a great space in Beverly, which was kind of, you know, heading back that way. Josh did the opposite, made the commute up to Beverly for a little while, and then eventually uh, moved up here as well. So that was yep. the beginning of it, I guess. Okay, great. Yeah. That's and more or less how it ended up for me too. Um, I think I grew to love the North Shore after visiting Dana so so often and driving to Beverly. And we both have a we share a common uh, love for uh, fishing. So mm -hmm. the band's known for that, of course. So we spent a lot of time on the rocks. And I think between the reverse commute and trimming that down and then wanting to fish more, I ended mm -hmm. up making a move up here to Rockport. Well, I think you guys are ahead. We're ahead of the curve because now the big rush is on to oh, yeah. <laughs> see that <laughs> to yeah. find property here on the water. Believe me, so that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you um, collectively, uh, the best you can, give me a sense of the big picture of the genre of work that you operate in artistically. Um, you know, and you both have mentioned, um, you know, your love of graffiti. I'm actually mm -hmm. kind of curious even how you two met and whether most of your work is together or separate. Um, but first, just talk about the world that you operate in, because it's a big world physically and um, artistically. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Well, I'll, I'll kind of merge all these questions. So Josh and I met um, when we were both in college age-ish um, and it was through graffiti. The group that we were painting that we, we met with was called Project SF and it was kind of a graffiti crew. So a bunch of kids, you know, painted together and shared the same, um, you know, like crew name. And then Project SF also had like this different angle where we were all artists outside of just painting our graffiti stuff. So it was more about, um, exploring different avenues of creative output. So graffiti was the base model, if you will, but we took it to different places. Like we did warehouse parties for a snowboard company we, where we did live painting. We did um, uh, like silk you know, screen. painting gyms, silk screen t-shirts. Yeah, we kind of like opened it up into like an art party vibe where we created um, interactive experiences and whatnot, as opposed to just painting graffiti. Um, so we expanded from that really is how Josh and I that, that, that was the root of our collaborative efforts, right? It was like starting first on a wall together, painting our names next to each other, and then slowly collaborating to create a piece together on that wall. And then um, in later years, we revisited that in Project SF by collaborating artistically to create murals for, um, you know, clients. But um, my, our, our, our worlds are pretty different in terms of like um, what Project SF does and where that happens. I'm sorry, my dog is behind me. Um, yeah. Uh, so Project SF is really client-based work. Our, you know, not only do Josh and I pretty collaborate effective. on Project SF, but the client is always the third partner. So it's never just us alone creating something and throwing it out there. What Project SF is built to do is kind of take our, ego out of it a little bit and not make it about what we are or what our voice is, uh, but really listen to what the client wants and try to use our creative, um, you know, skills, if you will, to take their idea and bring it to life or, or to even in other circumstances to figure out what that idea is. Cause sometimes the client don't really know yet what they want. Um, whereas what Josh and I do individually is very much rooted in whatever we want. There's no, um, you know, third collaborator or second collaborator in there. It's just about our vision and creating um, what we want. And myself personally, I focus on abstract work that's very much rooted in graffiti. Like it came from the idea of these expressive mark making, um, mm -hmm. you know, drips, splashes, uh, textural works um, that really, again, are rooted in stuff that you'd find on a graffiti wall in the city, on the street, or or, or, you know, in the act of making graffiti, kind of those lines and marks and the mm -hmm. tags and whatnot is where I got a lot of my inspiration and where my body of work that I was building kind of came from. So, And Josh, what's your perspective on this? The um, world you operate in. I mean, it's similar to Dana. I mean, it was, yeah. I guess, Project SF was certainly the foundation of my collaborative work, you know, working closely with other people mm -hmm. on projects that you often, you know, wouldn't and 
the the part that was it being a live kind of production a lot of times was kind of cool too because it opened the door and allowed people into a space that is often extremely private and so that was good and uh from there i mean my work was as I, as you mentioned in my bio was heavily photographic driven i mean i was the kid who always had the camera around my neck always photographing all the exploits all of her mischievous behavior um you know keeping a catalog of what went down. And then from there, I kind of started shooting uh, freelance photo work, a lot of um, model home shoots. I go in and shoot uh, for developers, I do a lot of nightlife photography. I go into clubs and shoot that. And in you know, all the while I'm still painting graffiti mm -hmm. and I'm um, mm -hmm. kind of finding my um, wheels there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I you know, worked at the ICA installing exhibitions for several years okay. and that's kind of, got me yeah. connected to that that you know the corporate art worlds and kind of seeing how that worked yeah. um so all in all i'm just kind of just developing myself and figuring out who i was as an artist and I, eventually i landed on this kind of balance of kind of abstract vegetative uh imagery whether it be like you know a sprawling sapling coming through the concrete and photographing that and finding the beauty in it or you know a decrepit building that was you know knocked down and now there's plants growing in its place. So a mm -hmm. lot of my work kind of revolves around that interaction between what humans did and had and done and where the plants and earth is kind of reclaiming itself. It's wild stuff. It is, yeah. So, but this is still, you would say this is your individual work versus yeah. you've done this in the collective at all? Did you uh, here and there, yeah. Dana and I, when we do collaborate outside mm -hmm. of Studio Fresh, we kind of have this really cool, uh, I don't know, uh, symbiotic relationship you know mm -hmm. Dana's abstract splashes and I throw in some like plant life in there and it ends up mm -hmm. being some really cool pieces and we can send you some images of that yeah that's great yeah. so the um SF tell me about SF collective um is it still around is it active um does it generate commercial work or tell me about that group not really it's no. legacy lives on I mean okay. people still talk about the parties and the events okay. that through but I mean, I think everybody who was involved still has a, a love for it. And, you know, it's some part of us wants to kind of bring it back. But yeah, we've all got creative careers. All of us do. It's just that, you know, we're all in our mid 40s now and not painting graffiti together as much. And the active like the collaborative murals, um, just not everybody ended up going down that road of being painters per se, you know, um, yeah. like one of our good friends who is really active in it is in film now. He's working on films like um, around Massachusetts in the film industry. Mm -hmm. um, one of them's a teacher and an illustrator, you know, so people have done mm -hmm. different things with their cream. It's just that Josh and I have found ourselves back in this painting on walls um, thing. Mm -hmm. I took seven years and was in the footwear world and did design for mm -hmm. Converse for seven years and then kind of came back to this as a career. So uh, yeah, we just happened to find yeah. our way back. But everybody's still active and we get together. We're yeah. also friends. It's just not uh, a collaborative in the sense of us showing together yeah. and creating yeah. collaborative work. So I would say then we should really talk about um, a little bit about Studio Fresh. Um, if in fact that is how you guys come together and the kinds of works that you have produced collaboratively, I think that would be a good place to go. And, you know, I'm, I'm very curious how your work even comes to you. You know, in other words, um, you know, is this something that you guys have to work hard to find clients? Do they find you? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of pretty amazing that when I looked at your websites, the span of work that you've done, you know, it's pretty extensive. That's not an easy trajectory for anybody in the arts world, let alone yours which your work which is so specific yeah. let's see so like i said we've been collaborating for different you know tasks or end goals for a long time and individually as artists we've been working for clients and for art shows and whatnot and it, at some point along the way i think we both um made the realization i certainly did that you know you get asked a lot when you're doing a um it's just say somebody hired me to do a painting for their house or whatever and it was my mural but they want it for their house most of the time they have some comments about what they want you to change and how they want mm -hmm. it to fit and it ends up not really being your true expression of artwork and this is not mm -hmm. true in every case but this is a general mm -hmm. takeaway and um so at the time i had an idea of just kind of like well why don't we create a business that's less about like Dana and more about like whatever this company is and we can use creative skills like I've been working in design forever we can both paint we've worked collaboratively forever 
to, um, you know, collaborate with the client, make something that they want, say yes to all their changes as best we can and not worry about how that reflects back on our personal portfolio, but create a new portfolio of kind of design works for clients. So that was kind of the original idea. Um, we started with a lot of like CrossFit gyms, painting graffiti for stuff mm-hmm. like that, really kind of, you know, mm-hmm. entry level stuff for what we were already doing, really graffiti kind of things. And then I think one of our first big jobs was um, Tavern Road. Um, and that was like a first, like big one for us to kind of do a corporate like install. Like really, it was really artistic. It wasn't like, um, you know, we weren't working too much with the client to like tell like a specific story. It was very artistic. Um, mm-hmm. But it was the first one where we really got our foot in the door to see what that would feel and look like um, in the in the you know world outside of like CrossFit gyms and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that started the ball rolling, and we did a bunch from there. Um, Middlebury College um, was another big one that we did that was like a really good test for us to um, to see about scaling things up and how we could uh, you know execute large scale uh, graphics that were you know for large clients. We were helped with that by Josh Weiner, who is a famous muralist in Boston. He was somebody who kind of helped us get our feet under us when we first were starting out. He hired us to assist on a few projects, um, which helped, you know, not only establish ourselves in the city, but meet um, some clients and also Mm -hmm. learn some tricks. But also, yeah, I mean, I should mention this, too. At the time, like there was a lot less mural artists um, doing this when we started 10 years ago, whenever it was. Mm -hmm. Um, There was us and a couple of the old school guys like Josh and. Josh Weiner and um, David uh, Victor. David yeah. Mm. And then, yeah, there's a couple other, but really it was just us. Now there's uh, quite a few more. I mean, people who used yeah. to be graphic artists or vinyl artists or now sign painters and uh, mural artists. And yeah. the trend's gone and I get it. And there's but, also uh, so other that, graffiti crews too that have kind of also kind of yeah. jumped on board yeah. and uh, sure. making murals, yeah, now, which a, is great, you know. Yeah. Yeah. More that's energy. Great. So is it a, um, because I know some of these projects, I remember when I interviewed uh, Trisha O'Neill, I mean, they require some pretty serious crew in a sense, right? To get them done. Have you guys had to bring other people in or do you mostly just do it together when you have Uh, these? It's mainly just Dana and I, you know, Uh if there's a project that is, you know, beyond our, you know, four hands, we hire out, you know, and we work with Mm -hmm. our, our, our catalog of artists, not ours, but our friends who we yeah. know what they're capable of and how talented they are and, yeah. and you know, fulfill what we need. But yeah, there was only like really one project that w- required that. And that was um, the Babson World Globe that we painted oh, in 2019. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're going to show that. That that looks pretty intense. So how big intense. is that? I can't tell from the photograph. What's the scale of that? Well, it's a 28 foot diameter steel okay. ball that weighs 50,000 pounds. Wow. It rotates <laughs> and it's, you know, beginning when it back in the fifties, when it was first built, it actually revolved to with the season. So it kind of, hmm. it's really cool. Um, yeah, it's really cool. I, I believe it's the largest hand painted rotating globe in the world. Oh my. I believe uh, there's, there's bigger rotating ones and there's bigger hand painted ones, I believe, but not that do both. Yeah. 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 Hey, that's quite a tribute. And of course, you know, Babson has a big connection to this area too, you know, you know, so that's a nice, uh, yeah. another little Cape Ann connection for you. There you yeah. go. So how about talking about the actual process? I'm, like I said, I'd like to just go back to everything from um, the way you even find out about projects to where I'm you sure, begin, yeah. you know, and like, I'm is it, that. yeah, yeah, that's all right. All right. That's yeah. fine. Because the, the, <laughs> it is an interesting thing because I think other people, you know, you have to think you're also at a stage now when we, we can get to that where, you know, there are young people looking to do this, right? So I always like to have the artists that are a little bit more established talk about, you know, what what the next generation needs to be thinking about. But let's start from the beginning. Yeah. Talk about your process. Well, we're very fortunate, honestly, that most of our uh, clients come to us. We've established... Uh, ourselves in this world in terms of what we do <laughs> and uh the uh you know we, we don't do a ton of outreach we don't do a ton of like uh you know posting or chasing jobs or we have some uh, great relationships with consistent clients that come back for all of their projects um because we've you know kind of their go-to and uh yeah and and like i said we've established ourselves as the people to go to when there's something that's hard to do so you can't necessarily hire an artist who just does this because that's what that artist does and you can't hire just a painter who only can paint that so you kind of need someone who's creative that can 
figure out how to get that thing, you know, so we've worked ourselves in this niche that not a lot of people do. So, and, you know, Boston's mm-hmm. a small town and once you establish a reputation, you kind of get called back. So we're fortunate um, for that. Um, you know, I think most people that have been successful in this world have done mm-hmm. what we've done, established relationships, right? So you have mm-hmm. some sort of consistent mm-hmm. base to build off of because yeah, uh, God knows freelance is tough enough. But if you don't have like um, consistent yeah. clients coming back to you, it's really hard to stay, stay moving forward. But yeah, I think that, you know, we're very lucky. I'll, I'll be the first mm-hmm. one to say it. We, we got in early, we built a reputation and people come to us for it. So we don't have to like stress that part of it too much. Okay. So rather than talk generically, um, I think you should pick, you know, one of the pieces that um, you sent to me and just literally take me from the time that you got the commission, right? And how you like, just what the actual process of doing that particular, you know, one of these, because they're all unique. They're all unique places. They're all unique situations. There's weather. I mean, my husband happens to be a painter decorator, so I get the weather part, you know? (laughs) So, um, so tell me more, give, pick an example and just take me through that that part of the process once you get the commission. Um, Sure. Yeah, Josh, do you want to go? Do you want me to do? I mean, I'd say the Babson project was probably like the biggest and most difficult thing to kind of wrap our heads around because it was such a, a foreign mm-hmm. surface of being three-dimensional. You know, it's a sphere, mm-hmm. not a, a, a flat wall, you know. Right. So from the get-go, I mean, we had to f- find a map, a proper map that we could reference. And you know, Dana was really good about sourcing that out. And, and even then we had, it was an 18 by 24 image that we had to then scale up to, you know, 42 foot patterns. And that was pretty wild. And and Dana, you can fill in here if I'm missing anything, but you know, we, Babson uh, was an architect, I think, I I can't remember the the company, but they approached us about, you know, would we be interested in painting this steel globe? And we were like, always we say yes. I mean, we, we would never say no to that. And, and, and as we said, yes, and we started talking and, you know, this was, probably a year and a half prior to us actually painting the, uh, the piece. Um, yeah, I went through multiple emails back and forth of uh, the proper imagery, um, mm-hmm. what to use. And then it finally came down to us, you know, producing a, um, a sample. Mm-hmm. And that happened in, you know, an offsite location because they had to relocate the steel ball from one point to another. Mm-hmm. And we, we did that and, you know, we realized how undermanned we were and underprepared once we started painting this thing and realized it was going to take twice as long as we initially estimated. So we had to go back and tell them that it was going to take X amount of time more than we thought. And this Mm. is what we need to do it. And at that point we were their only option. So they kind of had to go with us too. So Mm. it worked out. Um, And then from there, we, you know, I think we started in February of 2019 so it was mm-hmm. the heat of the winter, a steel ball, and it's freezing outside. So they had to <laughs> encapsulate this whole thing inside of this massive tent right. and heat it, you know, to like 90 degrees to keep the, the steel ball at a, you know, a temperature where the paint would adhere. And I mean, there was inherent problems. We were working around yeah. other crews, other construction people, sanding, mm-hmm. grinding, throwing dust everywhere. So it was, that itself can be kind of tricky navigating around other trades at the same time when you're there to do this specific thing. Hmm. Um, but, you know, ultimately we, we got the job done after I think two months of painting, um, you know, starting with the patterns took a week, week and a half to get on. And we start, you know, filling in the, the shapes from North pole down to the South pole. And we come back with the detailed elements, the, the lines, the, the real high contrasting color. And then of course, all the labels and, the names of the countries and the oceans and the seas. And so that was hmm. quite the project and we're still reliving it. I think every day. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Is it, yeah, is it maintain? Yeah. Does somebody have to maintain that in any way or is it, it goes on in perpetuity the way it is. We, we hope. Might have to re-clear code it occasionally, but yeah. Much, yeah. 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 That's great. Did that bring you any other work that project? I'm just curious. Not that we know of. Surprisingly not. It was like such a, we got on, Josh got on the cover of the globe from that. And it was, I mean, n- n- even if I wasn't involved personally in it, I would be thoroughly impressed. It's just like, that. you don't see that, like hand painting yeah, yeah. a globe texturally like that. And I'm, I was personally shocked that it didn't get more. All of our artist friends thought it was the most amazing thing they'd ever seen. 
Everybody yeah. else is a hard pass. They were, they were not impressed. Don't but, forget, you were on Fox 25. Oh, that's right. for I, made, too, I so. made the news, too. Yeah. Fox News, baby. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I would love to give one other example, if we could, too, because it kind of shows slightly different. Um, so, like, you know, Studio Fresh kind of does two things. One is um, we don't design, which is kind of like this world one. We didn't necessarily design the world, right? We just kind of picked mm -hmm. the map that we wanted to execute and figured mm -hmm. out what we wanted and then other stuff we're asked to use our kind of creative talents to help um, mm -hmm. bring this thing to life. So uh, last winter, it probably happened a long time before that, the initial contact, but last winter we were asked to do a um, series of corporate um, office buildings out in Concord. And they had, you know, I think it was five buildings, four buildings, and they have, you know, lobby spaces and um, communal spaces within these buildings that are kind of blank and nothing's happening. They wanted to do, um, it's just something to dress it up and bring some life to the spaces and potentially, uh, tell a story about the uh, area that they were situated in Concord and whatnot. So, you know, first step is bidding on the project. People want, um, you know, numbers up front. If we're all on the same world, then we can move forward. Um, and then we jump into creative usually. So for this project, it was really like a wide open, like, what are we going to say here? What the color bird co colors were wide open, stories were wide open, walls were wide open. We can mm -hmm. kind of pick what we want to do here. So, Josh and I selected a series of walls within the building that we thought would be good focal points. We start with mood boards, kind of like outlining aesthetic directions where it's like, hey, do you like this look? Or do you like that look? Do you like, you know, floor to ceiling graphics? Do you like woodland scenes? Do you want something more urban? Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, graphics, graphics. Anyway, so you play with that. We come to a, a vibe, a board that we all agree on. That's like, hey, these all feel like things we like. And then you start rough sketches based off of that. So we all kind of have a, you know, a goal in mind or like a vision in mind of what stuff's going to look like. So we design um, graphics, obviously go through a few rounds of edits. Then we have final graphics that we can install on the walls we picked and then we paint those on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there's a couple examples of those um, in, the, in the images that we can show. But those are a good example of kind of that design and then yeah. the project as opposed yeah. to stuff where we're just responsible for the painting. Right. And in that case, um, the, who was the actual person that you were bouncing things off of, like in the company? Like, what was their job description that you were working with? I mean, That's a good question. I mean, it was a group. I, somebody yeah. that was basically the uh, you know owner, director, or whatever who made the final yeah. calls, and then a series of marketing people um, and yeah. just people that were involved in the kind of like. I assume this was all in an effort to get more tenants in. So somebody who was involved in that end of it, somebody who was involved in the design. I, I yeah. honestly don't know exactly what everybody's yeah. job title was, but so that was in Concord. Is it does it have a name, the building, or is it yeah, it's middle, middle sex screen? Yeah, middle, middle sex screen. screen. Okay. Yeah. Right. Very neat. Okay. Well, that's exciting. I, I think, you know, then you're almost acting like your own ad agency, right? You know, you're taking yourself through the you know, the whole, the whole process. That's yeah, great. You had asked um, in one of your pre-questions about yeah. like, do you consider your work public art or advertising? Yes. Josh and I actually had a conversation about this last night. Cause it's like neither really. I mean, we create public art, but it's not for art's sake. It's for advertising sake, but it's not just for advertising. It's gotta be artistic too. So it's kind of both. <laughs> it's really like this new paradigm of like um, hand painted, advertising right it's like make it creative make it say something more than just a glossy ad because yeah. there's hands and heart in it and it's also like a uh, you know really boutique like way to tell a story like you can kind yeah. of like well, I, I think you're right uh, and the reason I asked the question is I think we live now in a world of um, you know people aren't going to just believe advertising right there has to be a bigger message in it um, because it's really according to the viewer these days Right. There's no way you can actually just, it's no longer one way communication, you right. know, right. Too, too many opportunities for feedback. So that's great. Um, it's, it's very, it's very interesting. I mean, you guys definitely are telling a story with your work. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes I though, I'm curious, did you ever get into a situation where the work was too edgy for one of your clients? Maybe once in the beginning when we were doing a gym or something, it, mm -hmm. we maybe went overboard with some too many splashes and she wanted it toned down a bit. But oh, yeah. a lot of times, you know, Dana's really good about talking with working with the clients and kind of yeah. making them feel comfortable with, you know, a, a digital design that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily represent fully what the hand painted would look like. So, right. you know, talking right. to the client and making sure that they're like, hey, this is 
what we're going to kind of do, but it's going to be more energetic and have more splashes or drips there. So we talked about the Babson piece is a very challenging piece. Is there any other piece that you'd want to talk about in terms of like other, a different type of challenge? Yeah, Maybe. Josh, why don't you talk about the, um, some of the, uh, uh, what do we call it? Anamorphic stuff. Yeah, those are cool. So I think we have an image there. It says 400. And mm -hmm. if you look at that, if you're familiar with anamorphic graphics, I mean, they're meant to be read or viewed from a certain perspective. And as you kind of move beyond that vantage point, it mm -hmm. morphs into something else. Like it gets all distorted. So that so, image is, you know, us looking down a hallway that's probably 100 feet long. Mm -hmm. And those, that, those numbers will come back down the hallway at least 40 or 50 feet. Um, there is a video on our website that kind of shows us walking yeah. this piece. So that was a, a tricky, challenging piece. Unfortunately, it was, you know, three flat walls instead of a multi-dimensional surface, you know. So, you know, in that we, we used a projector to kind of lay out the image from the hallway and then trace yeah. these long, exaggerated lines and hope that it would kind of shape up to read, you know, as it did. This was a fun challenge because the client had specified they wanted this and it was just a way of sprucing up, you know, wayfinding graphics and making it more interesting. Um, but yeah, it was, a, I, I, we've done a couple of these and there's such a unique, like, again, it's yeah. something that your average painter won't do. It's like, you got to find somebody who can kind of execute basic shapes, but then figure out how to do it in this artistic way. But um, yeah, those, another one yeah. we did was on the hood park in Charlestown. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. We did a big hood milk graphic across this awning and doorway in, mm. in the opening space. And, it's cool. You walk up the stairs and you see the this you know oval hood logo, and then as you move aside, it just turns into this really weird abstract you know figure. Wow, yeah. I've never actually heard that term, and this is a first for me. So thank you for educating oh, yeah. on that. That's very very interesting. Um, so that's three flat walls, but looking yeah. at it from afar, wow, that'll be so interesting to show. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's everybody fights the EBF um, stuff that's in there. So everybody fights is a boxing gym that was um, originally located in downtown Boston, in the, um, mm -hmm. in the Southie basically seaport area. And they um, have since expanded uh, really all over the country, but you know, heavily in the new England area. Mm -hmm. And they've um, stuck with us, which has been awesome. We developed a relationship with them early on when they opened their first gym to kind of like design and help with their mm -hmm. whole aesthetic branding internally, like with the walls. Um, and have since done every one of their locations from Chicago, Atlanta, Kentucky, um, and then everything in the Boston area, um, you know, the suburbs of Boston, et cetera. So that's been really cool. And that um, is, you know, that's, I guess, more of that edgier stuff, but they came to us looking for that. They wanted this graffiti aesthetic and whatnot. Um, and then uh, the Derby Street stuff, the hot air balloon one, Derby Street's a uh, outdoor mall um, in uh, Hingham. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's Market up uh, Market Street up here and the street out in Chestnut Hill. It's kind of all the same group of um, mm -hmm. malls. But that client has been with us for a while, too. And they have us do this rotating mural outside the, the, the Woody, the Jeep Woody that's in that image. Mm -hmm. Always based on that wall. And every season, basically, they update the surroundings. So we uh, paint white over all the balloons and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we'll add like a sailboat or whatever the next okay. thing is, or, you know, and we work mm -hmm. with those clients to, again, like they come up with a theme, we illustrate it, come up with the design and then install it. And then, so it's kind of a rotating public art piece. Those are cool. Cause it really just gives a yeah. uh, fun public art piece for the area. I yeah. love it. I love it. We're going to move on to the Gloucester mural now though, because oh, sure. that is the, that's the crux of all this. This is how, how our relationship got started. Right. So, yeah. um, I just I'm curious um, about that one. Did was that a call to artists that you responded to, or um, how did you get connected to the the mural down at Ocean Crest? So, I had worked with Awesome uh, Rockport um, painting a mural in town here in Rockport behind the library. I worked with Sal's really the guy who runs Awesome Gloucester and Awesome mm -hmm. Rockport. And after I completed that, he he's a guy with a lot of energy, a lot of ideas, and he came to us and be like, Hey, would you or studio fresh be interested in, you know, working on this idea we have um, there, you know, they already came to us with this like vision, like we want to paint a, a mural that commemorates all the fish workers that are on land, you know, not just the fishermen themselves. So we got into talks and Dan and I met with Sal and uh, Ann Malloy from Oceancrest mm -hmm. uh, seafood there. And 
we just started talking about, you know, what they wanted to see. We started, you know, filing through all these um, historic images from the historical society and just, you know, we all, you know, like Dana just kind of suggest, or, uh, mentioned earlier, we went through that whole design process where we kind of came up with a mood, pitched some ideas and they commented on it and, you know, they go, went back and forth and ultimately landed on that image that's on the wall. Hmm. So it was really cool. Well, we are definitely going to, um, you know, show that video um, because I think yeah. that really does tell the story beautifully. And um, it's a, it's one that will go on in perpetuity. I was actually down at Ocean Crest this morning. And um, once again, Eddie, who I believe is Lenny's brother said to me, they just captured Lenny so perfectly. So okay. congratulations to you on that. We're going to show the video. That's one of the motivations for the project. The backstory goes back about 10 years. And one interview, we were talking to this woman, uh, Joey Azaro Busby, who had made a living earlier in her life packing fish. And she sort of stopped the interview and she gave a speech about how it's right to recognize the fishermen. They're obviously instrumental to Gloucester's history and economy, but that females who worked in the industry themselves, mainly the fish packers, tended to get overlooked and ignored. And she made a speech about how instrumental those women were to the industry and the history of the city. And that sort of stuck with me. That was 10 years ago. For every one fisherman, they say there's six shoreside jobs to go with it, supporting jobs. So there's six times more people that worked on fish on land than the actual fishermen. It was almost all women. Most of the men went to sea, so all the women were the ones that were home to pack and uh, cut the fish. Every boat could have anywhere from 40 to 80 to even 100,000 pounds of fish. And, and now we're lucky if we see that in one week. And we'd have four or five, six boats a day sometimes. I'm so impressed with how hard these people worked. I remember coming over in the morning and see fish cutters in the early morning fog, walking down the street with these huge fillet knives. You know, just walking down the street with their knives. It looked like something out of a horror movie. A lot of them lived down the floor and they'd come in and they, they'd pack fish and uh, fillet the fish and all that. And then at Mug Up, they would go and play cards and I would go with them. I, here I am, 14 years old, all these older fish cutters and fish packers and they'd welcome me, come on in, let me take your money. <laughs> we'd play cards for 15 minutes real quick and have our little Mug Up, you know, and get back to work. And I'll never forget it, the stories and the characters and the, the expressions that they used. and. Yeah, it was just an amazing, great experience for me as a young kid growing up down on the waterfront. The Fish Workers mural is an awesome Gloucester conception. This group came up with the idea, did research, made connections so that we could get access to the wall, the artists, the funding. We're both, you know, recreational fishermen and enjoy that quite a bit. But for me specifically, uh, personally, it was much more about having a local impact. So to do something that's kind of a historical archival in our neighborhood that celebrates the people in our neighborhood was huge. It's like almost leaving our little our mark, you know, over the years. Because you know, long after we're gone, that building will probably still be there, and maybe the mural itself. So it's like a little timeless gift to the community. It's kind of like a collage almost. Like you can get several dozen really old photographs that we can cut them up and kind of dissect them and take you know a singular person out of a group of people and use that. Take images of fish cutters, a group of ladies, take another image of a lumper in the background. It's kind of like a, a treasure hunt. So the, the final piece was a, a tunnel vision almost, a light at the end of it with the lumper in the distance. We have uh, a group of women fish cutters from like the 50s. The fish cutter in the bottom right corner of the mural is my cousin Lenny McCollum, who worked for our family business his whole entire life. He passed away in September from cancer. He was also my best friend. And he's got two brothers that work in that building now. It meant a lot to them to see him up there.
you know, just got an email from Anne Malloy saying how great it is and how it's touched the entire family and the community. And so in the end, that's what we want is like the customer, whoever we're working with to be excited, you know. Seeing the neighborhood people come out and tell us how much it means to them is more than we could ask for, so that's awesome. And I hope every time the community sees it, it reminds them of how hard the women all worked down there back when a lot of parts of the country still didn't have women working. The women packers were absolutely thrilled that I've talked to. They're in their 80s, 90s now, but a lot of them have reached out to say how happy they are that it's there. A core aspect of our mission is preserving heritage. All the people who have made a living in those jobs, not just the jobs that are represented on the wall, but all the people who have made a living on land, on fish, we want them to feel like they're recognized. The community considers their contributions significant, and if those people felt visible and respected, that's as good as it can get. Um, so to sort of close today, I wanted to ask you if you have any other um, opportunities coming up on Cape Ann or any ideas for Cape Ann that you want to share. Um, and if not, just what's next for you as in your own artistic evolution? Well, I don't want to speak too much about it, but we're currently in the works and talks with Awesome Gloucester again on another project in town. And I'm in fear of it not happening or jinxing it. I don't want to say too much about it, but. Hopefully soon we'll f have something in the works. So, all right. Well, that sounds great. You guys are a gift to Cape Ann. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Um, and I hope that um, I hope that you're able to uh, really enjoy the fruits of your labors and see it every day and be be part of the community. So, yeah. um, with that, um, if you can just point us to how you would like to be contacted um, on a you know as a team. Or individually, we'd like to show all that on the screen if you just want to make mention of the best way to, to find sure. you. You can reach, reach Studio Fresh at contact at Studio Fresh Boston or visit www.studiofreshboston.com. Okay, that's yeah. great. Well, that is actually going to wrap up this episode of Cape Ann Art Waves. Thank you again to our artists today. Thank you again to our generous sponsors. We invite our audience to look for us on Facebook and on YouTube and all of the 1623 channels. And of course, our marketing partner is Sea Arts, and uh, they will be sharing this via the Sea Arts eblast. So make sure you sign up for the eblast and turn on channel 12 um, to catch this interview in full. And thank you, Josh and Dana. Thank you, so welcome to you both. Thanks.